Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, make a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink and get ready for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own favorite stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet. Let's get started. Have you ever stood up in the middle of a work shift and left your job? Why if so? Part 4. One time only, leave an 18 wheeler full of food. I used to work for myself as a computer tech and as a delivery driver for a company that brought food to restaurants. I did my best at both jobs. Working as a driver was hard work and the hours were the same or a little more than what the law allowed. In case we were caught, we were shown how to use the electronic logbook. I drove three days a week, but I always worked more than 40 hours. The other work I did was both at home and at customers' places, extra 40 hours a week most of the time. To give you an idea of what a delivery driver does, a typical route would include many stops where they deliver between 800 and 1,200 cases of food. One of the guys on our team was supposed to help out when one route got really busy, but I don't think that was his choice. I believe his boss, Travis, gave him the job. Travis and I weren't friends, but I didn't know any of the problems between us. My route was at least 1,400 cases for weeks. Every time, I'd text Travis and ask if I could get help. It took him at least an hour to answer, and every time he did, he said the helper was busy on another route. Didn't bother me, I just worked as quickly as I could to finish it. The path kept getting longer. One day, I had 1,900 cases to do. Even my hand truck couldn't fit in the trailer. It had to be strapped to the outside. I did, of course, ask for help again. Since I didn't hear back right away, I started. Every other day, my first stop would take about half an hour. That day, it took about two and a half hours, not just because there was more stuff to deliver, but also because the trailer wasn't big enough to break down the pallets and load the hand truck. I had to literally climb up to the back of the open trailer and put each box on the ground as I unloaded the first pallet. I called Travis when I was done with the first stop. There was no answer, so I kept going. After three more deliveries, I was finally back to my normal speed and efficiency, but I was still behind schedule. Around stop five, Travis calls me again, but this time, he's not to offer help. He's upset that I'm late. I kept my cool and told them I needed help badly and had been telling them that for weeks. You only work three days a week, what else do you want from me, was his answer I'll never forget. I told him I was done right away and wanted him to come get his truck. I left it where I got it in the morning and went home. After the fact, I learned that Travis, his helper, and another driver worked that route until 10 p.m. Felt very justified. I was in corporate at a consulting firm. Here's a little story time. So I get there and my direct manager's telling me that I needed to do everything that those who came before me did to build their book of business, but frankly, their techniques sucked and I openly said that, yeah, well, those aren't effective. So then week two, I set up a meeting with a cybersecurity firm, CTO, publicly traded and looking to launch a few projects. My manager, managing director, strategic VP, and president of the brand all tell me it's not a good idea, that I shouldn't have engaged, etc., etc., etc. After that meeting, we scope a potential 500k project. And fast forward, we get terms authorized, and it turns out to be 700k worth of business, plus a forecasted 325k coming down the line. Obviously, the higher-ups can't say yes now. Side note, I had set the record for meetings in a month at this point, also still only my first month in. My manager then says it was luck. So, then a week or so later, I set up a meeting with a company that was doing the drones for Walmart delivery. I loop in one of my colleagues to help scope the project. We walk out with an estimated 815 k worth of project. The president of the brand says we need to secure an exclusive servicing agreement. I say it's a bad idea, that it's too soon, we hadn't proven our worth yet, and that it's like asking a girl for marriage after the first date. My manager then says they've been doing it longer, so they know. Then they put me on a call with the strategic head of exclusive servicing agreements and the prez of the brand, plus my manager, plus my colleague and his manager. 
on the call of the head of ESA, he's like, you don't look like you agree with this. And I go, no, I think this is a terrible idea. We've only had one meeting. We just scoped the project. The client is expecting us to come back with a scope of work, not an additional pitch. It's a bad move. They're like, well, we're going to do it anyway because we don't want to lose the opportunity. And I'm like, first of all, I would lose the opportunity by your guys' lack of patience or perspective. Oh, not to mention, the leading consultant, in terms of gross, he was grossing $1.3 million a month in the firm out of our New York office, then hits me up to loop him into the op. And I tell him I'd do it if he hooked me up with one of his. This guy runs to the prez of my brand to cry, and then the prez of my brand tries to tell me to play nice. I don't think that was a left field ask. Anyway, fast forward, the client backs out, and I lose a potential million dollar account. Fast forward, my manager starts getting jealous, saying things like, Oh, he's so perfect, he doesn't drink coffee. Oh, you should do what everyone else is doing. Oh, you need to stop being difficult. To be clear, I wasn't being difficult. Their tactics just sucked, and I innovated. Not to mention, my manager's team was last in the firm when I started and was only grossing 5k a month profit. By month three, I had generated 700k in project fees and 20k a month profit. Fast forward to month seven, I've made the trip for top performers, outperformed my budget for the year by 217% and hit my budget at month 4.5 and been all over the firm leaderboards for first years. So I go on vacation, and on vacation, my manager was supposed to be the leading account management for my first client, the cybersecurity firm. And he's dropping the ball. I mean, I'm getting texts from the project team, emails from the client themselves, etc. So then I start running the project from vacation. Then I get a text. What are you doing? So I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're on vacay. Da, 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 da. I'm like, bro, I'm not going to lose an account. I don't care if I'm on Mars, especially not my first. So then I make sure the project is good and get back to vacay, then make my way back to town. Now I'm looking for ways to really splash in the market to expedite my gross. So I talk my managing director into letting me pilot a program. As I'm working on this with one of my colleagues in a meeting room, my manager storms in. He's like, got a skewed vibe and he's red. He's like, where were you? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we had an all hand meeting, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, well, I was working on this. In my head, I'm like, bro, get the F out of my face. I'm working on something to help your team out. He's like, well, you should have been there. And my face turns and I'm visibly annoyed. At this point, he almost like, I don't know, realizes it's just me and him in this room right now and he ain't about it. So he backs down a little bit. At this point, I'm like, bro, I've done so much for this guy's team and all he's done is make the whole process so strenuous. I literally look at the board with what I was working on, look at my hands, do I really want to deal with this anymore? Should I wait for my bonus? Should I take this pilot program leave and start my own farm? Am I tripping? Maybe I need a breather? So I walk back to my desk, look at my monitor, look at my laptop. Everyone's talking. It's the end of the day. My manager gives me a soft smile like we can get through this. Yeah, I think that was it for me. I leave my laptop on the desk, grab my bag, and go to shake his hand. Hey, I'm putting in my two weeks. The other guy's dumbfounded, just staring. Then I walk to the exit. Tell me about an HOA or neighbor who's been a nightmare for you, part four. I work for HOAs in a property management company specializing in HOAs slash POAs. There's plenty of nightmare stories from the other side. One neighborhood a-hole paints his house and fence pink and purple. Indeed, those exact hues, bright pink and plum purple. He informed me of his progress in advance, and I informed him that he needed to complete an application, provide samples, and await the HOA's decision. No, I'm good, he replies. I debate this jerk back and forth. I'm positive that this absurd neighborhood won't permit it, and he will be hit with fines and told to stop. All he does is keep saying, no, I'm good. It seems that a-hole has a friendly relationship with the board, I only interact with the ACC committee, which approves or rejects improvements. One board member insists that I forward the exact two sentences he said to the ACC and let them make the final decision. 
He said this to me while yelling at our business for not knowing how to handle people or ask nicely. I forward the ACC. No, pick different colors. WTF is the ACC. Even after I inform a-hole via phone and email that the ACC said no, but if he changes it, we will reconsider, he continues painting. Because he's friendly, this HOA is treating him like royalty. No, a-hole says. When the violator notices it, he informs the HOA. A cease and desist was approved by the president. A-hole blows up at the ACC, the site manager, my boss, and two call center reps. He claims to be an artist repeatedly. Remind everyone that his house is effing pink and purple. I'm all for sticking it to the homeowners association, but in an HOA, you don't paint a ranch-style home those tacky clashing colors. The house is the first one you drive up to, so your neighbors are complaining that it's ugly and depressing the value of the surrounding properties. I give a-hole artist several calls. The board member who first yelled at us is calling us again and accusing us of being negligent for allowing him to paint the surface before ACC had an opportunity to resolve the issue. The effing thing? The ACC removes their balls and says that if he just changes the color, they will still approve. The a-hole artist is happy and remarks, I'm very kind and professional. A board member finally thanks us, stating that we prevented them from being sued, but we still could have handled this more effectively. The neighbors remain enraged. They signed petitions that the board had turned down to have that house changed. A certain board president feels that playsets are the reason behind her father's death. She makes ACC deny playsets even though their governing document clearly states that they are permitted within certain limitations. I have attempted to clarify that, in accordance with state law, nuisance refers to undue unreasonable or health risk, so you cannot deny them because your neighbors might find it bothersome. People with play sets, GD them! Their parents, Karen, get a life! There are homeowners who install crazy stuff. Every so often, a homeowner screams in an ugly email to me that no one is harmed by his colorful pigeon house. Coop cage? Pigeons are a common sight, ruining gardens and congregating in unsettling places for motorists. Regardless of the lawsuit's outcome, the state health department has denounced it and threatened to send a crew to tear it down because the birds are causing health problems. Now he's embroiled in a major lawsuit with the HOA. I forward it to legal. One of my board members is persistently inviting me to business dinners. Together, we do not do any business. He says he has a career proposal with the HOA and that he's aware of my good work. What kind of nonsense is that? Because similar to a non-profit government, HOAs are entirely run by volunteers. Unless you work for a third-party property management company, which I already do, or if I were a vendor for landscaping, pools, etc., there's no career within a homeowners association. I informed my boss that he could either stop asking me, I deal with the ACC chairman, a really laid-back young married IT guy, or change to a different HOA, or he could give that HOA to a male coworker. It would be too soon if I never heard anything more regarding a portable basketball goal. Certain HOAs are locked down. Some are impartial. Beyond that, Jesus, for people to want to move there, they have to have an amazing proximity location or something. The neighborhood in which my family and I lived when I was growing up was a secluded, private, gated community that contained fewer than 30 houses. They had a small private HOA that was not run by a corporation, but rather by the homeowners themselves. There was always this ridiculous rule that they made, but the one that stood out the most was that there was to be no parking on your street. This was a particularly challenging situation for my family. Within that house, we had my mother, my stepfather, my two brothers, and my two step-siblings living there throughout the entire year. We were all in possession of automobiles. That's seven cars that are always present at the house. We only had three cars because we had a garage that could accommodate three vehicles. Our driveway was situated on a steep slope, which made the situation even more difficult. Our parking spot would be behind the garage, and then we would have to park two cars behind those. 
The situation became even more severe when we made the decision to convert the third car garage into a home gym. The third car garage was a single car garage that was detached from the two car garage. It was a complete and utter disaster when someone in the garage had to leave before those four cars blocked them. They threatened to have every car on the street towed in the middle of the night, so we eventually just parked on the street like regular people and racked up fines after fines until they threatened to do so. Following an entire year of being subjected to this nonsense, my parents and a few other homeowners who were in a similar situation with their family decided to take action. The Homeowners Association, HOA, was managed by a small group of board members and a chairman who were senior citizens who had resided in the neighborhood for 20 years ever since it was developed, and they were not challenged by anyone. The board was the only person who showed up to those meetings. Nobody else did. In the end, they were successful in obtaining proxy signatures from each and every homeowner, and they were able to outvote them on numerous significant changes to the neighborhood, including the ridiculous parking situation. They ousted the chairman of the board, and he apparently threw a temper tantrum in front of everyone. If you want to watch the part 3, click the link here. Thank you for subscribing, the likes, and comments. We're very happy to see you all in the comments, too. Thanks for your support.